Hi, this is Vivian from Pharmasalon. Before you watch, I want to let you know that if you're interested in getting a CE credit for this video, go to the show notes below. There's a link to the Compounding CE website that will take you directly to the quiz for this class. The show notes also include the questions on the quiz, so be sure to check them out. While you're there, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today on this session called Budgeting for USP 800. This process is, is what I do for a lot of 503A pharmacies, is really where I help answer their number one question is, how much is this going to cost, right? That's one of the top three concerns of every business owner and every entrepreneur. It's always cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And now we are, we are in, the, in the future when our state board decides to enforce chapter USP 800, we're going to incur costs, right? We've got to externally exhaust air. We've got to possibly bring in new engineering. We've got all of these other things. And there's no doubt that writing a new set of hazardous drug SOPs, as well as uh, new training assessments and all these other things, rear tying gowns, double shoe covers, the additional PPE costs, that's going to add a cost to the process. But, the, but this particular presentation is going to prove and show to you that the financial brunt of USP 800 is actually going to be in the construction and in the engineering. And so hopefully today we can help answer some of those questions is how much is this going to cost? Of course, it is a little bit different for every pharmacy, but this will kind of enlighten you and help you better understand what the process is going to look like. So I have no conflicts of interest, no, uh, there's nobody sponsoring this and you won't see any manufacturer sponsored products in this particular presentation. So I'm on a project right now and it's a fairly large project, probably 2000 square feet of compounding space. And that includes both sterile and non-sterile and it goes through all aspects and all chapters of the compounding. Let me kind of, kind of back into that chapter usp 795 which is non-sterile non-hazardous usp 797 which is sterile non-hazardous and then both aspects of usp 800 which are going to be both non-sterile and sterile hazardous so we've got a multitude of different rooms positive bubbles negative bubbles anti-rooms gowning rooms both non-sterile rooms. so there's a bunch of spaces they're diversifying their portfolio because they're thinking okay if we're going to invest this kind of money into use to be USP 800 compliant, then we're also going to send new feet out on the street to tell our story, to talk to new providers and stuff like that. So they're making a huge investment. And I think after in some of the early conversations that we were having with the with the architect team, it was determined that this project is too much for the pharmacist, the pharmacist in charge, who's also busy running the pharmacy as an operations person as well to also jump in feet first into the construction process because this process for us started a year ago and hopefully in the next week or so they'll be getting the keys what we call the certificate of occupancy moving in getting the clean room certified and all of this process so think about this from a year of your life if you are doing significant volume and you and you we've got to commit anywhere from six to 12 months of your time for multiple architect meetings and engineering meetings and uh, helping understand what light fixtures and all of those intimate details, you may want to step back from that and think to yourself, do I need to hire a third party project manager? Because you can see this chart on the left, it's a little bit of an eye chart. It's actually called a Gantt chart. And Gantt chart really helps us measure time and effort and task. And then on the right hand side, it kind of macros out to show you the, the, the given timelines. So don't let the spreadsheet kind of jump in front of you as, as overwhelming. But really, so let's say if you're an independent, smaller pharmacy, you do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you've got non-sterile only. So you're going to have a 795 room and you're going to have an 800 room, both of them non-sterile. One's under negative pressure and one's in externally vented because that's your business model. You're in a community where you service non-sterile HRT, but you don't do sterile injectables. Great. So this could probably be a project that you can take on by yourself or in addition to the general contractor who is supposed to be on your team. So someone said, well, wait a minute, isn't my general contractor also my project manager? So the definition of a project manager is a person who's a, who makes everybody on the project team a good steward of your time and your money. So that project manager is hired by you to work for you to make sure that the subcontractors and contractors are not abusing your checkbook. Because what they do love, and maybe I'll hit on later, is what we call change orders. When we don't clearly define the scope of the project, on the backside, general contractors and their subcontractors 
plumbers, electricians, mechanical contractors, they're all going to hit you with what's called change orders. I tell folks a lot of time that construction is fickle. I've been in construction my entire life. My grandfather built houses. My dad's an electrician. And I spent a long time actually in the construction industry until that wonderful thing happened in 2008, where the economy kind of crashed a little bit. Um, construction, here's the point. Construction rarely finishes on time and rarely finishes on budget. And I used to use the term never and never, but I think that scared people. So let's just use the words rarely does it finish on time, rarely does it finish on budget. And that's where a project manager hired by you to look out for your checkbook could, in fact, be the person who's, who, who makes everybody be a good steward of your time and your checkbook. So that's something to think about as moving forward. It is a huge effort if you're doing some volume at your compounding pharmacy. So communication, and, and I hit this over and over. I do a lot of Zooms with architects and engineers and general contractors and plumbers and electricians and HVAC contractors. Um, because we're in this new Zoom world now, right? Which is great. It's a great online tool, and I can kind of corral everybody around a set of drawings, and we can talk about purpose. But getting everybody speaking the same language, moving in the same direction is super, super, super important. I can't emphasize that enough. So you say, okay, how many, am I going to need this entire project team to come in? All of these folks that you've got listed here by on this list, am I going to need those people? And the answer is maybe, right? So if I tell you later, and I'll show you later some of the mechanical keys to this, is that if you integrate new mechanical equipment onto your building and you're going to do other structural pieces or, or other construction pieces, do you have to pull a local building permit? This is where we rely on the general, local general contractor to tell us. And he'll look at the scope of the project and say, yeah, you know what, I probably do need to pull a building permit because that's the right thing to do and I don't want to get in trouble, don't want anybody else to get in trouble. Well, to submit a set of plans, to get a building permit must be stamped by an architect. Well, if it also has new mechanical equipment and new HVAC system, now I've got to bring in the mechanical engineer to stamp the drawings. If I've got structural issues, I've got to bring in a structural engineer. Well, if there's new electrical drops, a new electrical panel, higher electrical needs, now I've got to have an electrical stamp. So now everybody's stamping all these pieces of paper just to get us to a, to a set of plans to get us to a building permit. And the answer is quite possible. And I can tell you, nine out of 10 projects, and maybe I'm generalizing, but I'm gonna say nine out of 10 projects that we design and work on, yes, requires those people, the architect, the engineer, um, and that's gonna be 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, those sets of drawings that they professionally stamp is expensive. So that's one of those unintended consequences, and I've done quite a few podcasts and, and written papers on this, is the unintended consequences is that when we start getting this deep into externally venting air and smooth and pervious surfaces and having to do remodels. These are the unintended consequences where you're going to incur new people in your project team that are going to also going to cost you money. The biggest point here is everybody likes to point is like, well, it wasn't my scope. It wasn't my scope. It wasn't my scope. And I had a project on the East Coast and that was like, we used to make jokes about because everybody wanted to point and say, well, that's not my scope. It is really the job of the project manager or somebody like myself as a consultant or your general contractor Somebody's got to take ownership of communication and make sure that everybody's speaking the same language and moving in the same direction because there is an excessive amount of moving parts in construction. So where's the majority of your money going? Well, if you look at both Table 2 and Table 3 in Chapters USP 800, you'll see that both of them called it the CSEC, that is the Containment Secondary Engineering Control. That's a fancy name for our compounding room, which is under negative pressure. Both of those sterile and non-sterile CSECs must be externally vented. That means that we're taking perfectly good air, conditioning it to the temperature and humidity we need, putting it in the space, and pumping it out of the space. So this is the supply side, and this is the exhaust side. And there, there's always varying pieces of the equipment, but this is a good generalization of what that might look like. And some will say, well, wait a minute, what does externally venting mean? Well, I've kind of gone back and discussed that with some, some folks. And they said, it means out of the building. And I said, well, how much of that air? And they say all of it, right? The, the intent, the, although it's not explicitly stated, the intention is that no air introduced into the hazardous drug room would ever be recirculated back into an HVAC system to be reintroduced either into the compounding room again or other spaces that it shares its HVAC trunk lines with. So the intent of the chapter when we quote unquote externally vent is that we need this type of equipment. 
So I can tell you that if you pump, and look at this right here, this is called a jet plume. It's sending perfectly good air out of the building. Once it goes out in the atmosphere, we don't get that back. And you have to replace it. You cannot dump air out of a building for non-sterile 12 times an hour, 24 hours a day, over and over and over, constantly dumping air out of a building and not expect to have to replace it. Same on the sterile side. ISO 7 buffers are doing 30, a minimum of 30 air changes per hour, and all of those 30 air changes are going out of the building 24 hours a day because you never shut down a clean room. You never lose control over that controlled critical space. And I can tell you, and mark my word, this is not up for debate. If you put air out of the building, you've got to replace it. That is not negotiable, and that takes a dedicated makeup air unit in some form or fashion. There's nothing about your existing commercial DX equipment, uh, so recirculating piece of equipment that was ever meant to do externally minted. It just doesn't exist. So this is where the brunt of the money goes right here when you put this up on your roof or outside on the curb and there's always other things happening uh, with every building. But this is where the brunt, this is the unintended consequence of USP 800. So the makeup air unit right here must replace all the exhausted air from the biological safety cabinet, which is connected to this. Right, and it should also read temperature and humidity. One of the most common calls I get, and I let's say it's weekly, bi-monthly, whatever the case is, and sometimes, more, sometimes in July and August, it's much more frequent. The call I get is, that, Brian, we can't maintain both temperature and humidity standards in our clean room. Right, so as we drive the thermostat down, because my folks are in there sweating at 64 degrees because they're you know they're wearing all of the PPE, so we start driving the thermostat down. Next thing you know, we start uh, losing control over humidity, right? There's an inverse relationship there, and that makes perfect sense. So that dedicated makeup air unit moving forward has got to read both temperature and humidity, right? We call that a modulating compressor or a scroll compressor. Or, um, but your existing piece of equipment that you have now only reads a therm only has a thermostat, which means it only reads temperature. And that's why a lot of these clean rooms around the country are are not performing because their makeup air, their air handling system only reads temperature and not humidity. And when you drive one down, you lose control of the other. And that's probably the biggest point that I drive home with my conversations with engineers. When you put people in rear tying gowns, double shoe covers, double gloves, hair bouffant and mask, 64 degrees in a clean room still may not be quite cool enough for employee comfort. USB 797 says we must we we should maintain it below 20 C. And even though it's assured, I can tell you a lot of state boards will say that's a hard must for them. They want to see your temperature humidity logs consistently below 68F, which is what we know is 20C. But if you're running a clean room at 68F, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, it's still not going to be cool enough for those technicians, those employees, those pharmacists that are in the PPE. <clears throat> so let's consider the energy costs, right? We've already established on tables two and table three that we must externally vent the c set and part of that on the hazardous side in our iso 7 hazardous buffer is this biological safety cabinet right so the reason why i bring this up this is important to see is that if you look at this first category it's called a bsc a2 and a2 has a 70 30 interior recirculation which means 30 percent is getting exhausted 70 percent is getting recirculated it is allowed and is stated that it is allowed in chapter usp 800 because it has an internal recirculation around HEPAs, right, so we're never recirculating potentially dirty air, it only exhausts about 450 CFM on average. And each, every model, whether it's four foot or six foot, will vary, but let's put an average number of 450. Now, some would say, well, I'm concerned about, you know, volatizing chemicals or other things, and so we're going to go with a B2 cabinet. That number with a B2 cabinet, there's no internal recirculation whatsoever. So you're actually going to end up exhausting twice as much air out of that hazardous sterile buffer. So I can tell you that volumetrically, you probably are not handling the amount of chemicals it's going to take to truly volatile, be volatile for the people, the process. But I'll let you debate that. But I wanted to bring this to your attention that every amount of air that is sent out of the building has to be replenished back with conditioned air. So if you live somewhere where I live in the South, I don't know if you can tell by the accent or not, but I live in the South. When we're taking that July hot air from outside, and let's say it's coming in at 94 degrees and 70% relative humidity, 
that makeup air unit is having to wring out all of that moisture, condition it to the temperature and humidity, and let's call that 64 degrees and 50% relative humidity to put it into my clean room. And every bit of that's going to get pumped out of the building. That is what is meant by the terminology external venting. And I know I'm kind of hitting this point a lot, but it's important that you understand this because that's where your dollars are going to go. So understand here that the amount of air that goes out of the building is important based on the piece of equipment that you're going to choose. <clears throat> so let's, let's go from the sterile side over to the non-sterile side. Now, <clears throat> if you look at table two, it says that the CPEC, the containment primary engineering control, the hood, um, must be externally vented or is preferred, or you can do redundant HEPA in series. And I'm going to explain what that means here. So if you if you connect your primary engineering control, your powder hood, uh, via the manufacturer's thimble canopy to the external exhaust floor, which is that big contraption I showed you earlier, that's energy that is going out of the building. And yes, this hood is going to contribute to the overall negative pressure of the space. Um, but I can tell you from being in many years in this business, these are fickle animals. My preference is, is that if, it's for, if you've got the budget, seven or $8,000 will then get you into what's called a redundant HEPA filtering series, which means I've got two layers of HEPA before it goes out of the building. Then I can recirculate this air back into the non-sterile room, which means that this hood is now not contributing to the negative pressure. It's room neutral. Now, we still have to use what's called a low wall exhaust grill to create the negative pressure in the space. Right. But understand that, let's say that your business is at a point where <clears throat> you've got four, five, six of these powder hoods. The more that you start connecting these things, the more you've also got a domino effect of varying, varying uh, static pressures, which just will make the, 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 the room jump all over the place. But also that's more energy going out of the building. So my recommendation is, is that we want to use the low wall exhaust. I'm sorry, I don't have that picture, but we want to use the low wall exhaust to create the negative pressure for the C-SEC and let the C-PEC be independent of itself. So now that it's recirculating back into the space, it's room neutral, it's not contributing to the overall negative pressure. And your state board, even though I'm showing you this picture and telling you that this is my preference here on the right, your state board is still gonna have to approve that. I still think that there's some state boards out there that do not know and are gonna struggle with understanding what is a redundant HEPA filtered hood, but this is the preference for, from an energy consumption as well as a balancing. Balancing this gets a little more difficult because I've got a fan on the roof. So let's talk about the materials of construction. And this question comes up a lot. Uh, these are, are both projects that, that I designed and worked on. One is on the East Coast, one's on the West Coast. One is a what we call a stick frame. You can see these are metal studs that were purchased locally with all of the electrical. And then on the right, this is a modular project, right? And we've got flush glazed glass, we've got FRP walls, um, all of the electrical runs and what we call these chases here. It is, it's beautiful, it works great. So does the stick bill. And so the question is, is what is the cost? Well, and this is not highly scientific, but what I've seen is that the cost of modular is, yes, it is more expensive than stick bill. Yes, modular constructs faster than stick bill. However, um, you've got to understand how that fits into the project timeline. And without getting too deep into the logistics of that earlier Gantt chart that I showed you, there are logistics issues that work into this and also having to get their, their stamp drawings inserted into your stamp drawings going to permit set. So you've got to coordinate all that effort. So I love modular. I love the fact that it comes with flush glazed walls. It comes with FRP versus this, right? So if I'm looking at the cost equation, I've got multiple trades that are coming in. I've got metal framing. I've got to put up a vapor barrier. Let me just kind of pause for the vapor barrier. Uh, this is oftentimes overlooked. If you look at the green wall in the background, that is an exterior wall to the facility. And we've framed interior to that. You never want to frame a clean room directly onto an exterior wall. But what they did later is they came in with this queen or what we call plastic or like a six mil poly plastic. And they wrapped these studs before they put up the gypsum in the FRP. The gypsum is your drywall. And the reason why is that we created a very dry and very cold room. This is a clean room, so it's very dry and it's very cold. Natural laws of vapor pressure, probably more than you want to know, but natural laws of vapor pressure is this has created a virtual sponge for any vapor 
that's coming in anywhere else. So the vapor barrier is extremely important if you're going to stick frame your clean one. Then we put the gypsum, then somebody's got to come and they've got to mud it and they've got to sand it. Then we're going to mud the FRP walls on top of that or an epoxy paint, which is a primer coat plus three to five coats, depending on what manufacturer it is. And th there's a lot of coordinating of these trades. And so when you get into this, and this is what we'll, we'll debate this with the GC, because it is the general contractor during the budgeting phase to help you answer your number one question, how much is this going to cost? It's their job to weigh these two options. If they got all their trades to do it this way, it costs X. And if they got all their trades or they got the modular wall company to do it this way, this is also an X plus one or whatever that equation then becomes. So I have found that yes, modular looks better, goes up faster, is, a, is just a great finished easy product with less trades, but it is going to be more expensive. Um, and again, you want to have your general contractor fish out in the market for prices in both directions to, to just make sure that that what I'm saying is true as it relates specifically to your market. So I remember earlier when I was saying that I was on a project and everybody kept saying, well, it's not my scope, it's not my scope, it's not my scope. Scope gap is what incurs these change orders that I mentioned earlier and change orders are gonna cost you money. On the back side of this, um, this is a project I took a picture because this is where the room pressure monitors and room pressure monitors, if you've got a current clean room now, you know that these tubes are breathing the pressure inside the room and outside the room and telling you is it you know 0 0.02 inches to 0 0.05 inches positive or is it 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 negative and so that's what these tubes are and this particular project was having a hard time getting somebody to come and finish as well as connect it to this telemetry and this telemetry is what's reading the temperature humidity they actually wanted consistent constant um uh, environmental monitoring, which I certainly recommend because it's great. All that data gets pulled up into a cloud, so you don't have to manually log on clipboards and paper temperature and humidity, but there's an integration of these two. Well, it got overlooked. It got overlooked by everybody, and in the end, it became an unfinished project, and nobody wanted to touch that scope, and of course, to get this, this closed out cost a lot more money than what it should have. This is just one example of what we call scope gap. And I will mention that sometimes with modular wall companies, there is scope gap there as well because they don't typically connect the mechanical. They don't do final termination of their electrical whips over to the electrical panel. Um, they may or may not do the electrical whips directly to the lights. And so there is scope gap sometimes with modular walls as to where does the modular wall company finish and where do your regular trades, your electricians and your plumbers come and connect right those final terminations. Who's going to actually install the hand hygiene sink? What about the eye wash station? Well, is, will the modular wall company take that? Or do you have to also have your general contractor hire their plumber? And I know this feels like a lot of layers and some of your, your, your ears are starting to bleed right now. But after so many years of doing this and seeing how painful construction can be on clean rooms and USP 800 rooms, both sterile and non-sterile, it's important to understand there are and can be a lot of scope gaps that happen and so what you've got to do is you just got to, again, make sure the communication is key. I said that earlier, and I'll say it a thousand times during the project. Everybody's got to be speaking the same language and moving in the same direction, and all of our sub-trades have got to be willing to work with each other. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this Fireside Chat. The reason why we're doing this Fireside Chat is I didn't want to get too deep in the weeds in that session. I, I tried to keep it as tight and compact, but there was a lot of information there. But I thought it would be even more neat to have one of my clients who just went through this full one year long process from design all the way through all the different design sets, the project team planning, the meetings, and then finally through the most painful part, which was construction. And so Austin is joining us today. Um, and what I really want to kind of get into is something, probably the main point that I made on this session. The reason why I got introduced to Austin in the first place is that he had an architect came in and the architect a lot of times will choose the engineering group they want to work with because Austin's not out shopping. He doesn't have time as a pharmacy owner to start shopping for engineers and plumbers and electricians. That's not his job. And so the architect, said, hey, we do a lot of outpatient facilities. We know exactly this whole healthcare thing. And the reality is the reason why I came into this project as the consultant is because they did not know what they were doing at all. 
And so one of the, the, the main points that I made, we're going to get deeper into this in, in that talk, was that even if somebody on that project team, whether it's the GC, the architect, the engineer says, hey, we, we've done these, we've done these pharmacies, we've done these things, we know what we're talking about. You still have to second guess. And I'm, I don't, I don't want to steal Austin's thunder, but before we get into the first question, Austin, do me a favor, introduce yourself if you don't mind. Uh, hi there. My name is Austin Lute. I'm a pharmacist by nature and training. Um, went to school at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, graduated in 2013. I uh, live in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, I have a compounding pharmacy that we just moved into on Monday, uh, so it's brand new. Um, here it went uh, six and a half thousand square feet and we went uh previous one was 1500 square feet so we grew immensely but um happy to be here and uh, let me know what questions you guys might have on an owner side yeah i think this will be a good a good back and forth and so just hearing it from the consultant or whoever it's always good i think to hear it directly from you so part of this fireside chat let's just jump right into it so there was a lot of moving parts and pieces with what we call the project team. You had the architects, the engineers, you had plumbers, electricians, you had a GC group, you had all these things, but you ended up hiring a project, a third party project management group. And the first slide, or really, I think it was either the first or second slide of the presentation is the question is, should you hire a project manager? And I think uh, I kind of made it clear that at certain scopes, smaller pharmacies, maybe not, larger pharmacies, probably so. I mean, do you feel like it was advantageous to hire a third party project management group? Uh, yeah, a third, for the size of the build out that we're doing from a brand new build out, it wasn't a remodel. So a project manager was needed and was helpful. However, the project manager was not um, of my choice. Not saying that the project manager was bad or anything there, they did a great job. But again, like Brian was saying, there's they just never done a compounding pharmacy. They don't understand USP regulations or state regulations. They know how to build walls and rooms, but they didn't really understand the full scope of what I was needing, where I'm building a tool. The rooms are tools and equipment, and not just an actual room. Um, I, I found them to be very helpful in a number of stuff, but for them knowing what regulations I needed was something that I found out very quickly that I needed additional help. Yeah, so I'll, I'll reinforce again what I said in the sessions that the, the role of the project manager is to be a good steward of your time and a good steward of your money. So in hindsight, um, you trying to manage the process versus that project management group, could, could you have done this without other help. I mean, and I hate to say that it's like maybe that doesn't sound good, but is as a as a pharmacy, you're running one simultaneously and then you're building another one. I thank goodness they were kind of in the same development and you could walk back and forth down the sidewalk. But in hindsight, is this something that you could have tried to manage yourself as a pharmacy owner? Well, so you said that it was a year long project, but that was a year long project that you were involved with, Brian. So we had the additional um, six months before you got involved um, to help build this out. So it was an actual 18 month build out of this new facility. So the first six months, um, the project managers and the engineers and consultants had this beautiful layout. I was able to be a pharmacist and run the pharmacy while they were doing their time and due diligence on the blueprints and all that stuff. And then about six months into it, um, there were questions that were just coming up that I was just not able to answer on a timely basis because I was running a pharmacy. Um, so on hindsight, if we did not hire a consultant to help guide them to the correct um, ways and paths and means, it, it, it this project would have been uh, horrendously over budgeted, um, probably not even on time. Um, even though we're, we were six months past due, but that was basically on the aspect that I probably didn't have the right team set up at the beginning. And that was, um, the ownership's fault, but we learned very quickly to, to have a consultant to come in. So hindsight, I would probably would, we'd, we'd still be in the same predicament that we were at. Probably it would be an incomplete project. Uh, over budgeted um, or um, not done yet. So 
yeah, hindsight, no, no, not, not have done it together simultaneously. Yeah, when I came into the project, and it was about a year ago today, or maybe 14, 15 months, the the architect had gotten to a point of a block diagram. And a block diagram is an actual early architecture. And they gave you these blocks, and then they expected you as the owner to start backfilling those blocks with equipment and plumbing needs and air handling needs and all these things. And to me, it, that's overwhelming to put all that back on you. So what I did as part of this project is I said, okay, ungulators, mills, sinks, hoods, we ended up getting a, a capsule machine. But there were so many parts and pieces that had to be populated within that diagram that I just don't feel like they, anybody truly got. And the architect, although a really nice person, right, super, super nice guy, this was a real learning experience and I've had follow-up questions with him and he's, and he said, you know, we didn't, we didn't know. We didn't know. Right. We didn't know. We didn't know. And they actually, as part of this budget, I want to go further into to what you said with budgeting and saving money is that they, the, the engineer budgeted like, um, like a $50,000 environmental monitoring system, which was called a backnet system, which was much like a hospital. Right. And again, so that's, they were having, again, having a hard time, connecting that this was not a hospital. We don't have a sophisticated house back net or what they call building information systems. We didn't have all that. And so when I came in and I'll let you speak to this, I trimmed that budget right off the bat. Oh, for sure. Like um, the cost of um, the consultant fees for the whole year um, was minimal compared to the amount of money that was saved within the first month. Um, just looking back at it. Um, and then it's just not even monetarily what was actually was helpful. Yes, that's always great, but it's actually the headaches that I was not coming my way or headaches that I didn't have to have. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions. I'm a pharmacist. I am not a builder. I'm not a contractor. I'm not a plumber. I don't know all this stuff. I understand where my scope gaps are at. So having someone that has done this and knows what they're talking about is where I save a whole bunch of time and energy. Right. Absolutely. And so we, we've had an opportunity to kind of do the Monday morning, Monday morning quarterbacking on the project. Um, and going back to kind of the budget equation, we, we were considering in the very beginning going with modular walls versus stick built walls. And I talked about that and actually showed some picture examples in the presentation. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the modular walls weren't they weren't almost twice as much as stick built. So let's say that the difference is, and I'm gonna exaggerate the numbers, stick built was 50,000 and then modular walls was 100,000. It was it was almost double, but in hindsight, thinking through the number of trades that had to come and go, would would you have gone, what would you have done differently on, on that wall project or on the walls themselves? That So that was one of the big, things that we had to talk about is one the modular walls would have increased the budgets uh, immensely but hindsight i would probably have went back and i wish we i guess brian might have pushed this a little bit more for me uh, but he's also been a great steward for my uh, uh time and money and all that but modular walls is where i think i'd go if i built another pharmacy it's just i won't have all these subcontractors com coming in i want to have the plumbers i want to have the FRP guys, I want to have the ceiling tiles um, or the cockers come in at different times. And basically what caused it to be what we thought we were going to make a cheaper and better stick build wall actually turned out to be a more time consuming and more expensive. It probably would have been almost as the same cost as modular by the time of all the uh, change orders came into place and was completed. And honestly, the modular wall, um, was supposed to take, I think, 16 weeks or something like that to be built, which seemed very uh, a long time from when we decided to kick off the, uh, the build out. But honestly, it would have been probably one of the quickest things that was done is if we just did a modular. Yeah, so part of the stick build is that a, a framing crew came in with the metal studs and stood all those up. And that's very timely, time consuming itself as well because they're individual metal studs then you've got to have a drywall crew come in and put up drywall do a simple mud a simple sand right that's hanging a lot of boards let's call that 75 to 150 board there's a lot of boards and a lot of sanding they had to do the cleanup then the interiors finishing groups had to come in and uh, mud and put the frp walls up 
And then that was actually a different group than the ceiling grid group, which was a different group than the flooring group. So all in all, and of course the electricians and the plumber, plumbers also had to come in. So I probably right now got about seven or eight different trades that are coming in, whereas we could have trimmed that significantly by having modular walls because they would have stood all those up, right? Yeah, getting through the planning process of drawing the modular walls, they have to engineer stamp the drawings at the modular wall company and then ship it over, manufacture and ship it. So that all, yeah, that 16 weeks seems like a long, but by the time you add that many different trades, right, it's... And there, and there would be less uh, amount of change orders and all that stuff because there should be no change orders. Everything was done. Um, you might would have to ensure that you have a few more eyes on it to ensure all the proper places are in correct order and um, in the space that you want it to be. But another thing that I would say on uh, modular versus stick, um, the modular is considered furniture. So it's something that you can depreciate. So it's something that we we're thinking about. So you always want to have your accountants and your financial people to help you out with that. And that was one thing that I wish I might have uh, was, I don't know, um, more savvy on. But now knowing this, I would advise to go modular, at least for the sterile. You don't have to do the whole non-sterile lab all that way, but for sure sterile to be modular. Yeah, and one of those Monday morning quarterback things that I think in the end uh, was tough to kind of swallow down is that to get the air hand, the, the two air handlers dedicated to the to the non-sterile areas and the, to the sterile areas, two different air handlers up on the roof, it was somewhere between an eighty and hundred thousand dollar upcharge to do structural steel reinforcement to the roof. So we decided to do split units and bring the air handlers inside. However, to my own fault, I didn't pay probably as close attention to where they were putting those air handlers and the access points. And I mentioned it uh, later on, I did catch it and mentioned it to the engineer like, Hey, you know, we've got to have a way to access this equipment and they kind of let it kind of dwindle. And then of course I kind of let it dwindle as well. And so now we we've had to kind of rethink how we're going to access from a preventative maintenance, some of this equipment. So uh, I don't know if you want to want to speak to that, but the, I mean, Ted, there's just so many moving parts and pieces with these projects. And, you know, I think your your project set between the architectural sheets, structural sheets, land development sheets, um, which there wasn't a lot of land development sheets, um, just all the different mechanical, all the sheets, it was probably like a 50 page set. And that can feel oh, overwhelming, sure. absolutely feel overwhelming, right? I have sometimes a hard enough time packing my bags on a travel. It's like, did I bring my toothbrush? Did I do this? Do I do that, right? So trying to know exactly where I wanted everything um, as a pharmacist it was very difficult. So the minor things that we have to adjust um, after being into the facility for the first four or five days now um, are minimal. It's something that I understood that there's going to be some scope gap. There's going to be some stuff that I was missing, but everything that um, is needed to run the pharmacy, to have it certified, to have it um, actually to produce stuff it was in good handling and everything's a uh, great nature of that need of that. But there's just a few things that we just have to go back and uh, revisit. But other than that, the, the nature of having a, the engineers, the architect, the project manager, we would probably have a little bit more harder time than what we are having right now. If we didn't have a consultant, because the lab, I would per se would the tab would not have allowed to, come to be in the correct pressure monitorings um, the the equipment that we would be using to do the pressure monitoring wouldn't be probably done correctly or looked into correctly and um, before we uh, I'd say that probably the last couple months we noticed that some equipment was right above the sterile lab and there's no way to access that um, that was something that just having you on site to look at it before they close the ceilings prevented a whole bunch of unnecessary work maybe two years five years ten years down the line once the equipment potentially would fail um, so even having the consultants yourself on actual premise every once in a while was very helpful yeah i felt like when i was on site i was doing a lot of teaching especially to the general contractors group you know the contractors it's like they were all like feverishly always taking notes and stuff and i'm like 
I, I get the fact that USP has given us a different animal, right? Completely different animal. And I've got a, maybe another story I can tell as a sidebar is that one of my former clients bought a dentist office or a former dentist office thinking that that was going to work. And because, you know, healthcare is equal healthcare, right? Why can't a compounding pharmacy work in a former dentist office? It's because a lot of the moving parts and pieces in the GC and everyone, and it just, it turned out to be a mess where they ended up putting that building up for sale. And so I always find that I'm teaching whether it's architects, engineers, general contractors, I'm always teaching people. So I would say this is a piece of advice. It's okay that if not everybody on your project team truly understands USP compliance. And if they don't, if you talk to your general contractor and especially your HVAC people and you say, have you ever done a critical or controlled environment? And they go, no, we have not. That's when you say, okay, maybe it's time to bring in a consultant. Somebody's got to teach these folks because these are not plentiful, right? These aren't like outpatient facilities. These aren't like ORs and ERs and every other thing. They're just not as plentiful. So we understand that there's going to be some teaching. So um, I would say qualify as much as you, as best you can, but it's never going to be perfect. Correct. And I, I think that's with most things in life, but um, I felt like we or I uh, paid for a whole bunch of schooling for a, um, a whole bunch of people. And that is great. You get to learn something, but I guess I was on my dime that I got to train an engineer and train a architect and a project manager. So now they have on the resume that they built a right. sterile right. and non-sterile and non-hazardous and hazardous lab. So they know exactly what they're doing. So Hopefully the next team that they work with, that they can do a better, quicker job would be what they can maybe gain from this experience. Yes. Yes. Good point. Good point. So we've got about 10 minutes left. I don't know if there's, a, if there's folks on for a Q&A, but before we turn it over to Q&A, also, are there any final thoughts or epiphanies or anything that you want to share with the group? I think we've done a pretty good job of it. Yeah, like um, the ones things that I would ever think about is like you have all this team thinking about all the equipment that you need, all everything that needs to be situated, the plumbing, the electrical, but take a step back and think about what you as a pharmacist might need, where you're going to put your equipment, where's your RAM, your mixers, your unguators, all that stuff is going to be going, and then think about where your computers. So we did all that equipment and we talked about computers. We talked about how we're going to set them up and make sure that everything's done cleanly. But um, we did miss a couple uh, ports where a computer needs to go. So uh, I would say look at your electrical, make sure your electrical and your data, um, you have plenty of space to grow into your place if you're doing a new build. Um, and the other thing we already talked about is I would say if you're going to lease or build buy a new building to have your consultants on first before you sign any paperwork to ensure that the property that you have and I, we did discuss this but that'd be one thing i would suggest um because we had to put some more electrical panels in and um if we knew that and if we knew that the w roof was not going to be um ideal we might have looked at a different unit in the building or tried something different so i would just suggest um maybe getting the consultants on quicker than what I might have done. And because I was under the impression that my team that was already pre-built was able to do all, but epiphany wise, I would probably suggest that. That's a good point. Of that previous story <clears throat> that I told you about the dentist office, they only had one 200 amp panel. And then when they finally got kind of the list of new mechanical equipment, and other things, and the GC was doing the budgeting, it was going to be another $47,000 to bring in another electrical panel, which for this size pharmacy was really a budget buster, you know? And so uh, that's a great point. Qualify the building first. I think you nailed that. And I think I've, I've written a blog on my website about this, but qualifying that building is almost as important as qualifying your general contractor because yeah, location, location, location is great, but yep. you got to, you got to ensure what you're going to be building in is able to do what you want it to do without blowing your budget. And luckily we were able to minimize that by reducing costs elsewhere. And we were on budgets, but that was thanks to the consultants and I guess you, Brian. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you joining us today as well. Um, Vivian, has, has anyone raised their hands uh, to ask any questions? Yes, I do have a question. I don't see anything on my end. I, I do looking. have a question. For okay, yeah. sterile compounding, 
what temperature and humidity targets did you use and will the new USP specs for temp and humidity affect anything for you? That is a great, great question. Kudos to that person to answer. So USP 797 says that we should, and really, even though it says should, a lot of state boards are going to hold that, hold that 20C to a strong must. And we know that at 68F, right? So some will say, well, we're going to spec out this air handling equipment at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, to which I would say, no, you do not. Because by the time you put a technician in a rear tying gown, double gloves, double shoe covers, hair bouffant, and mask, and they're wearing that five to seven to eight. Of course, I don't know your sterile gowns are probably very expensive these days. They're sweating at 68F. And so really you would want to spec out that new air handling unit at 64 to 65F as your target temperature. Now there's another caveat to that. And the should is that that room should be under 60% relative humidity, right? And so you want to spec out as part of the compressor unit that is going to target 64F or 65F and 50% RH, which is relative humidity. So there's an inverse relationship. If this is if this is wrong, this is this is going to kill you financially, right? And so as you start driving that thermostat down, those coils inside that unit can only wring out that moisture so fast. So you're starting to lose control of relative humidity. They're going to start to walk away from each other. So right off the bat, your architect, your engineers, when they spec out the equipment, they need to target that you never, you never engineer something to the lowest common denominator. So if you engineer it at 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 60% relative humidity, that unit is going to fail. It's got to be 64F, maybe you would say 63, but let's say 64 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity. And yes, that's going to possibly increase the size of the equipment, increase the size of the footprint, increase the number of coils and components inside of that. But you do not want to lose control over your clean room because your engineer didn't know how to spec that piece of equipment. Great question. Love it. All right. Who's got a follow up? And remember, you can also raise your hand. Um, and does, I don't know if the person who asked that question has a follow up. <clears throat> if they have a follow up, do they just click the audio button? Yeah. Or, in they the upper right? in, okay. or they can post it in the chat. Okay. All right. Super, super. That was a stellar question. I tell you that's the, the call as, as we're waiting for another question to come in, the call that I'll get mostly starting around April, May, June, July, August, September, and I'll get this call a couple times a month at least. And they're saying, Hey, we can't control typically the humidity within our clean room. What's the problem? And I'll say, well, that's actually an easy one because that means the engineer and I'll have them send me the, the, the spec sheets and, or what we call cut sheets or product submittal sheets. And sure enough, the engineer spec'd it out at 68, maybe 67 and 60% relative humidity because they were going by USP standards. And so even to that point, let me further that a little bit more. When you design uh, an ISO 7 room per USB 797 should be at least 30 air changes per hour. I design or tell the engineers to design at 45 air changes, which is more. And I've had engineers fight me on this, go, what, what are you doing? That's so much more air. Well, there's a lot of unpredictable factors, especially geographically, that we can't control high pressure systems and thunderstorms. And you'll find that when there's a high pressure outside, they'll actually affect the balance of your space inside because you've got pressure pushing down on the room. So you want to make sure that not only do you spec that temperature and humidity standard that we just discussed, but you also want to uh, put the CFM, which is air, at at least 45 air changes per hour. And then also account for all the airs that's going out of the building. And if I haven't said it a million times before, if you send air out of a building, you've got to put that same amount of air back in the building. It is a one-to-one -one ratio, or you're going to have even bigger problems. So there is a huge chess match of fault that goes along with specking out a makeup air unit for a clean room that needs to stay up 99% of the year, 99% of the time of the year. Okay. And you do that exactly what you just said with ours. So I, yeah. again, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I did for Austin and what his engineer really is there were so many different rooms within your clean room, Austin. I think there were seven, one, two, three, uh, there's, five, um, six, five five rooms, but kind of a different little corridor space as well. And we engineered everything on what's going to return, what's going to exhaust, 
at 45 air changes, the entire clean room, even though you can have an ante room as an ISO 8, we actually designed it as an ISO 7. Um, so for various PPE reasons and stuff like that, but the engineer uh, designed it at that as well. He was, and he was very appreciative because he realized he was in over his head a little bit. So it's important that you over engineer something. Oh yeah. And just like you said, you're going to at some point need it's going to fail at some point, and if you fail at 30, you're going to be out of whack. So if you're right. at 45 and it fails to 40, you're still good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry, I'm sure you guys, I hope you can't hear the dog in the background. Um, well, that <laughs> seems to conclude all of our questions. Thank you very much. It was very comprehensive. I, I really enjoyed hearing uh, about all the experiences and the advice. And I realize that was a lot to take in. Um, there's always questions around this process. Um, if you're getting into your design process and you've got questions, you go, man, my general contractor has said something that's just completely confusing to me. Um, I don't understand why the modular wall company won't connect the HVAC. They won't spec the HVAC. My HVAC guy doesn't want to mess with it now. Again, con when, if you've got these questions, here's my contact information. Write it down. Call me. Send me an email saying, Hey, I'm getting these questions on my job site, my architect, and I'll just tell a quick story about this. And I actually said it in the podcast for Pharma Salon as well. My architect, and this came up recently, said that they've done a lot of clean rooms. Do you mind looking at these plans? So they sent the plans over, and sure enough, they um, they spec'd out birch doors. Well, birch is a wood material. Birch is a shedding material. If you look at the definition of the materials we should be using in our clean rooms, they should be smooth and pervious free from cracks and crevices and non-shedding. Well, all wood products, which are organic products, are shedding products. Well, how many layers of epoxy paint do I have to put on a birch door? How many side styles and angles and bevels does a birch door have? Well, don't use a birch door. Use a hollow metal door or other type clean room style door that's made out of metal and of course has glass for visibility. So here's the point of the conversation. If your architect says to you, yeah, 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 we've done a lot of dentist offices, chiropractor offices, outpatient facilities, we've actually done a couple of ORs, and now, you know what, we've, probably, we've also done some pharmacies as well. We understand what you need. Understand that having another set of eyes for somebody who's on your side of the fence, you've got to go through these drawings with a fine-tooth comb. So um, I am here to help answer questions if you need me, and I really appreciate you joining this session today. Thank you for watching. Remember, if you would like ACPE credit for this lecture, click on the link below and register for the class. You won't have to watch the video again, just answer the quiz questions. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so you can be updated on all our latest content.